want to accelerate preparing life. Okay, yeah, we are live now. African thinker, we are live. Hi everyone. Hi Uganda. To all our viewers, we greet you in the name Almighty. We're live on Red Friday, the biggest issue tackling platform on social media. <clears throat> on the panel today, I have a few experienced individuals. I have a medical doctor, I have a super accountant, I have an advocate, all on the same panel. So you have all the reasons to be on this panel because it's got the best info that you can be able to listen to in relation to what is happening in our country, Uganda. Fellow comrades on the panel, I ask you to introduce yourselves as we kick off this Red Friday. There's a lot of issues we have to talk about today. I ask you to introduce yourselves. I'll start with you, Dr. Kauma. Uh, greetings, viewers. Again, my name is uh, Daniel Kauma. I'm based here uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, those uh, on the ground in Uganda and those uh, in the diaspora. So I look forward to uh, sharing some views and opinions with uh, the members on the panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kauma. Uh, now I move to the advocate from Boston, uh, Council Agnes, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, good to be here. Uh, my name is Agnes Kaziba. Uh, I'm an attorney here. Um, I, um, I lead the legal team um, in the NUP um, diaspora. I also lead the um, Foreign Relations Committee. So um, I work with different um, groups of people to, to move our country forward. I'm glad to be here. Um, if you want to reach us, you can send in messages and we can answer your questions the next time we are here. Uh, we look forward to interacting with you. Thank you so much, Council Agnes. We're happy to have you here today. Now I'll move to Texas, the coordinator in Texas, Comrade Edward Abiri. Please introduce yourself to our viewers. Uh, thank you, Comrade African Thinker. Uh, thank you, viewers. I am Edward Abili. Uh, as I have been introduced, I am the People Power Coordinator here in Texas, the chairperson of the Uganda community in Austin, Texas. And by profession, I am an accountant. I am so excited uh, to play a role uh, during this historical time in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Abiri. You've all listened, you've all heard from the good people, the experts on this panel today. You've heard from a medical doctor, a counsel, an accountant. And to me here, my name is Richard Kamia, AKA African Thinker, the coordinator, new people power coordinator here in Houghton Province, South Africa. We bring you the burning issues happening in the country today and all over the globe. There is a lot happening in the country uh, presently. You've all seen what has happened in the courts today. You've seen all the drama that has been in court today. You've seen confessions from Mr. Kibalama, who is the former leader of NUP. Comrade Agnes, from the time you've been following this case, as a counsel and an experienced advocate, what do you make of the contradictions, the confessions that we have seen Mr. Kibalama do and his colleague do today in court. What do you make of this? Um, thank you very much. Um, just to clarify, I'm an attorney in the United States, not an attorney in Uganda. I'm not proud to practice in Uganda. However, I am working closely with the um, with our legal team on the ground in Kampala, and I've been following this issue um, in the um, in the legal uh, perspective of things. And uh, what I've understood from following the case and learning from what the law in Uganda is and um, what the merits of the case um, are, is that there is um, the case that the government has against us is not uh, a legal case, 
this is not a legal issue, it's a, a political uh, persecution. We are, uh, we are very aware that the NRM regime and the um, Museveni um, attack people um, and um, prosecute people without um, following. They're, they're not very educated people when it comes to the law. They don't use the legal means when they go after after people. And that's the same thing they are doing here. They're not really, they don't have um, merits to their case. And that's why you see that when we came to court today to defend a case that they, they brought into court, um, that they're, um, they're intimidating us, they're using intimidation, they're using um, illegal um, detentions, they're detaining Mr. Kibalama illegally. Um, and you can see that um, when you see their claims, that when they are saying that we could, that Mr. Kibalama sold a political party to, to, to NUP or to Chagulani, th those kinds of cases are not, they're not following the law in that to explain it to a lay person, political parties are not for sale in Uganda. Under the law, political parties are not for sale. Um, members can join a political party. Political parties are public um, domains. So people can, any person can join a political party. Right now, I think all the people on this panel um, are, are members of NUP um, and a lot of other people in the, all over the world right now are members of NUP. So everybody can join a political party. We cannot wake up and sell a party. Even the person who started the party cannot sell the party under the Ugandan political party law, as far as I know. So when they are claiming that Mr. Kibalama sold the party, they're claiming something that's impossible to say, so to say. Um, and also, um, Mr. Kibalama himself has um, has clarified that that was not the um, the that was not a clause that was negotiated um, at all. Um, and if you look at the documents that were executed during the transfer of, of leadership, now to back up a bit, leadership can uh, move in a party. We can elect new members, we can, we can elect new leaders in a political party, and that's what took place. Um, so the NRM's claim um, that, um, or whoever is coming up to bring up these claims that this party was sold from one individual to another, that is something that's impossible. Um, and also the money that they're claiming was um, promised to Mr. Kibalama was not written anywhere. Now, if anyone knows, we can loan um, $5 million or $4 million or whatever amount has been going around that was promised. That's a lot of money. Um, and that is money that has to be written down somewhere. And there's no, there is no contract, no, um, no contract executed, no written document signed by any parties that promises that amount of money. So those are all um, concoctions that the NRM is coming up with. This is a, uh, an issue that is not gonna go anywhere in courts because there is no law to uphold it. Um, and this is an issue that they are just using to distract NUP and distract us and get us um, from concentrating on the issues that are affecting Ugandans. Ugandans have a lot of issues that they should be concentrating on now. Um, the failing school system, uh, failing medical system, they're taking us from discussing that and instead um, bringing us to um, to uh, concentrating on issues that don't really have merit. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Agnes. Being an experienced counsel, an advocate, you must be very well conversant with everything that you've told us. You've told us this case is going nowhere and we've already seen it happen in court today. You've shown us how these people don't know the law because uh, they, they think a party can be sold, yet it's completely impossible. Uh, Dr. Kauma, what could be your supplement on this? Um, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, it's very clear what's happening. Uh, and I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that uh, NERM is going to create as many small fires as possible because they don't want to talk about their record. They don't want to talk about uh, the number of Ugandans who are unemployed right now, which is almost over 40%. Uh, they don't want to talk about the failed healthcare mm -hmm. system. They don't, talk, they don't want to talk about the corruption. Um, and they don't want to talk about uh, all the human rights violations that are happening uh, in our country today. NERM is going to create as many distractions as they can until election day. We have seen this with Kiza Besige, where in one of the campaign, in fact, he spent all the time in jail until almost close to election day. If NRM had a, a way to do it, they would keep Honorable Chagulani in jail. 
Right now, they are going to try to do whatever they can to dis disrupt NUP uh, activities. For me, what's more worrisome for me in this case is the involvement of the army uh, in Uganda politics today. Uh, we have seen the CDF playing an active role uh, with David Muhozi. Why would the military be uh, interrogating a witness? The military, you have the police, you have uh, the judiciary, but they're using the military not only to, uh, to arrest this, the, uh, the witness, they're arresting him, uh, he's under duress, they're making him make uh, recorded statements and publishing them uh, on social media. So what, what role is the army playing in Uganda today? I, I think that's something which we need to think about closely as, as people in opposition, that if we win the 2021 election fair and square, what role is the army going to play? Uh, are they going to fall in line with a new leadership the way they are showing partisanship right now? I remember a few weeks ago, Museveni said that the, uh, the army shouldn't be politicized, but he's the one who is doing it. Uh, the army is actively engaged in our politics today. At the moment, it's, it's even hard to tell the difference between the police and the army because they are actively involved uh, each time we have uh, an election cycle. So in the case of Chivalama, it's definitely a distraction. Uh, he has confessed that he was under duress. Uh, he has confessed it in court, uh, you know, under the, uh, uh, knowing the repercussion that could happen if he tells a lie in court. So, uh, so uh, in my opinion, I think um, this is just another ploy and we should expect others to happen. Once this is over, we had the issue with uh, Bobby Wine's transcripts, academic papers, then we had the issue with the red color. Then we had the issue with uh, Barrett's. They're going to keep coming up with all kinds of distractions until we get to the elections because they don't want Ugandans to spend time discussing uh, the NRM record. So uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, NUP has to do a better job of sheltering Honorable Chagulani from these distractions so that he can continue with the campaign to make sure he makes his case before the Ugandan people rather than each day trying to put out those fires, explain to the Ugandan people what he did when he was in school, explaining how he acquired the political party. So we're creating all these destructions so that we don't get to the point where we're actually discussing um, the manifesto and the record of the NRM party. So this issue has to be addressed seriously with our legal team to make sure that it's addressed and settled. But at the same time, we need to move forward. Uh, and I encourage uh, all the advocates, all the activists, all the people on the ground who are doing the hard work to keep doing what you are doing because NUP is growing. That's why they want to tear the party apart because in the space of four months, NUP is a force to be reckoned with. So um, uh, those will be just my words on this. Uh, it's just like Agnes said, it's just a, a political witch hunt that is happening and it's sponsored by the NRM government. Thank you so much, Comrade uh, Dr. Kauma, for such a, a, a great analysis, talking about uh, advocates and lawyers. We've seen Honorable Segona do a great job today through cross-examination of uh, Mr. Kibalama and the colleague. Oh, it was really, really, really great in court today. You could see that all these people were pathological liars. Moving away from that, uh, Comrade Dabiri, you've heard very well what is happening with Noop, what is happening in the courts. Despite the fact that Noop is still a baby in, in Uganda's politics, it has managed to run a smooth vetting process. And everyone has witnessed this. We have seen a few people disappointed, some are musicians, some are politicians, uh, uh, career politicians, they've been into politics for quite some time. Comrade Abidi, do you think we should now start bracing for a new democratic government in waiting? When you look at the vetting process, should we start anticipating for a, a new democratic state from NUP? Absolutely. I definitely agree that uh, NUP uh, is leading Uganda uh, to a transformed country, a country where there's rule of law and a country where the will of the people is respected. More so 
unorganized government. Uh, right now, the NRM regime operates Uganda like a market. They are very disorganized. Everything they do is envisaged by corruption and run by Museven. Now, when you go to NUP, especially when you look at uh, the recent vetting process, it shows you how NUP is not only organized, but also uh, willing to go beyond boundaries to ensure that they provide Ugandans with the best candidates. Uh, they look at, they carry out background checks, uh, make sure that we do not have criminals uh, become leaders. They also go ahead and carry out background checks to make sure that the people that are elected or presented for election are people that will represent the will of the people, not their own interests. We have seen the NRM forward, send forward members of parliament who are only interested in maximizing their wealth. You saw that when the age limit bill was, present, was presented before parliament, they chose uh, to go for a bribe rather than the country's interest. And so NUP under the leadership of Bobby Wine has foreseen all this. So they're ensuring that they're gonna get lead, they forward leaders that pursue the interest of the nation not personal interests. And that's why uh, NUP is willing to sacrifice people that have perceived to be friends to the principal or to the president to be who is Bobby Wine. Uh, we have seen uh, people, the country was shocked uh, when uh, Jose Chameleon uh, was not uh, given a NUP card. It's not that Jose Chameleon is a bad leader but they had to choose the best of the best. You know, NUP is there, there uh, to provide Uganda with the best leadership. And so it starts with the vetting process. And just to make this clear, uh, the principal or Bobby Wine was not even involved in the process. That shows how clean this gentleman is. Unlike when you go to NRM, uh, where Museven is actively involved in the NRM primaries, uh, we saw uh, Mr. Rokutana shoot somebody after failing to make it through primaries. Uh, Rokutana was taken to jail uh, just to deceive or lie to Ugandans or to masquerade as though there was justice being dispensed, but shortly the regime exposed itself under the instruction of uh, the dictatorship. Uh, Rukhtana was released. He was not only released, but he was also declared winner of, an, of a primary that he had previously lost. So that shows you how actively involved Museven is in these elections, that he's willing to handpick his members of parliament, because he knows that down the road, they will have to make a hard decision uh, to either push, pursue the interest of the country or pursue their personal interest by following his instructions. But Bobby Wine, he's saying that, no, I'm not gonna get involved. I do not want members of parliament that are gonna pursue my interest as a president, but I want people that will speak out and pursue interests of the country. So this is a very good uh, sign uh, on the Bobby Wine side. And this gives hope to Ugandans uh, that there's a new Uganda that is democratic, uh, where the will of the people shall prevail instead of the will of a few. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Comrade Agnes. Do you believe that the politics of cadership and comradeship has come to an end? Because when Comrade Abidi talks about people like Joseph Mayanja, AKA Jose Chameleon, we're talking about a gentleman that has grown up with the principal, shared the same plat music platform with the principal, had the same friend circle with the principal, 
are we saying now the politics of cadership and comradeship is no more? Is this the end of it? Is no bringing the really politics we want to see? Um, thank you. So yes, I believe that we, um, as NUP, as all of us um, being members of NUP, we all aim to, to bring the best for our country. We all aim at um, bringing the most qualified candidates on the table to, to move our country forward. Um, and that is the same thing you saw in the, um, in the betting process. Um, first of all, I wanted to, to add on what, um, on a, um, what um, Comrade Abili said. Um, the, level of, um, of, the level of transparency that we saw in this process where um, NUP put out um, calls for people interested at all levels um, and everyone, general public was welcome to, to all up, apply for, um, to, to show their intent to run on NUP card. Um, or, and then they, the level at which they, they kept um, announcing to people who is going, um, who's going to go through and they gave everyone a fair chance. They gave all the members who wanted to run a fair chance to reach the people, and um, and that was intended to to bring the people into the process. Um, you can tell by um, when if, I don't know if you heard um, Honorable Chagulan speak this week, um, this a couple of days ago during um, the the barrier that he went to um, of Judge Babiri, where um, he expressed that the will of the people shall always prevail. So this is the same thing. All people were given time to go and consult with the people, um, and the and the people were to, to express who was their favorite candidate. And those are the candidates that were put forward as the um, as the candidates running on the on the card. Now, when it comes to on concentrating on the on on Jose Chameleon or um, or just Mayanja. Um, I think that we, we need to separate that. Jose, Jose Chameleon is not a bad person. He's not a, um, a disqualified person. We just needed to get the best people and the people who have the best interest um, of, of the Ugandan population and who are, have the qualifications to move those interests forward. So um, Jose Chameleon went back and expressed interest and said that he wanted to run, to, to be nominated as, as, a, as a, the single, and oh, uncontested candidate. And again, we go back to the transparency. NUP put out um, put out a, a document calling everyone else who's interested. That is the level of transparency that I'm talking about. We didn't just run to to chameleon and make a phone call and say, now that the other person is out, you can go through. We still put it out there to the people, and we still um, held ourselves accountable to the Ugandans and said. Um, this didn't work out. Now we are out to to get a, a different candidate to so give Ugandans a chance to come forward and, and um, push up um, a candidate that they want to to represent them. So the level of transparency is is um, is showing itself right from the beginning, and that's the kind of government that we all wish to see in Uganda. Yeah. Thank you so much, Council Agnes from Boston. You've mentioned uh, a lot about transparency, how NUP wants to, to choose as the best. So basically that tells us how uh, the NUP wants to be as transparent as it can, because we've not had for the past 35 years, we've had a, a president that does what he wishes, chooses who becomes a minister, chooses who becomes uh, 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 most of the government department's leaders without consulting anyone chooses his friends, in other words. When you look at the country, most of the oligarchs are, are in big, big government positions. And this time we expect NUP to bring back that hope to Ugandans to say, you can earn anything on merit. Shouldn't be your name, shouldn't be your tribe, shouldn't be how you look. Dr. Kauma, that takes us to you. Having listened to all that, just a few days ago, one of Africa's leading universities was set on fire a historical institution. And on that, being big as it is, the country watched in shame when the fire brigade approached the, the fires and there was nothing that they could do. Actually, they ended up fixing the fire trucks at the scene. Should we then say that this is a failed step? 
Comrade Kauma, could you say that? Could you say this is a failed step? I think it's hard to make an argument against that statement based on what uh, we witnessed uh, on a number of levels. First of all, let's recall that this is not the first fire that has engulfed a school um, in Uganda. If most of you remember in 2008, we had 20 students, 20 young girls who died in their sleep when their dormitory caught fire at Budo Junior School. Uh, we have had several fires at other schools like Gayaza. I think they had two fires. Uh, there have been over at least 20 or 30 documented school fires across Uganda. Now, when you look at all of that happening, and that's 2008, we have had two presidential elections since that happened. And NRM has made promises about uh, improving emergency services in Uganda. I know they pledged to launch a national ambulance service. That has not happened. Uh, they pledged to invest more money uh, into fire brigade services. And that hasn't happened. I think most of you saw the trucks which pulled up at Makere. They couldn't even yeah. get the water up a short building. Now think about if, if one of the tallest towers in, in Kampala caught fire. And, and this is the fire brigade in the heart of Kampala. They should be the finest of the finest. But if you saw the trucks which pulled up and they couldn't even get water to turn off uh, the flames on the roof, it shows you the state of our country, Uganda, and you have to think about, we're talking about the education, who is the minister of education, that's the wife of the president. Uh, so th there has to be uh, an issue of accountability. And like my panelists uh, have mentioned that NUP is showing uh, better structures in terms of uh, having better leadership, better accountability, and that's what we want going forward. Now, when you look about, uh, when you look at issues like a national disaster preparedness, now there are four, areas you look at, and at the Makere issue, I want us to look at it into four areas. One is mitigation. Uh, when you look at national disasters, like we have had landslides, we have had some flooding uh, in Kampala that we have witnessed recently, and now we have a fire. So when you look at mitigation, what is being done to reduce the incidences of these fires? Uh, like I mentioned, we have had several fires in schools, even Kasuvi tombs uh, had a fire recently. So the government has failed to take the mitigation steps necessary to prevent the fires from happening. We saw this, the buildings that are, people are buildings, uh, uh, structures in areas which are not safe, they are flood zones, uh, and also the structures themselves are old. Uh, this structure was over almost 50 years old uh, at Macquarie, and no steps have been taken to make sure safeguards are put in place to protect the property as well as uh, the people in those vicinities. So, Mitigation is not happening, and that's the role of government, to make sure that the structures are safe and to make sure that the steps are taken to prevent these disasters from happening. The second step when you're preparing for disaster is preparation. Um, most of the time you, you hear about evacuation plans, fire drills, uh, and with all these fires happening, you have to ask yourself a question. Uh, is the state ensuring that fire drills are conducted in schools? Uh, is the state ensuring that the evacuation plans are in place to make sure like lives are saved, uh, to make sure there's less damage to property. Now, in the case of Makerere, it's very clear that there is poor preparation. In fact, even Makerere, the whole university had no fire hydrants present. The fire brigade had to go back to the headquarters to fetch water to put out a fire at Makerere. So you can oh. think about it. So, the second, third point I want to make is the response. So we're talking about mitigation, preparation, and response. It took them over an hour from the time the fire happened to the time the first truck showed up at Makere. Was it fire started around 12 midnight. The truck showed up after 1, 1 a.m. So the response time is very slow. And, and that's because we are not prepared. It's because there are no codes in place to make sure there's safeguarding of Ugandan lives uh, and property. Uh, so if you think about it, like even the police, people who were present on campus did not recognize there was a fire going on. It's the people who were on CCTV in Natete branch who alerted them that, hey, the building where you are is on fire. So there's a lack of preparation. There's a lack of structures in place uh, to safeguard uh, the property. The response time, uh, I also look at the equipment we have, because uh, do we have enough equipment to safeguard our properties? 
You saw the fire trucks which showed up, they're probably from the 1970s. Uh, and if you look at the gadgets the police has, when there is a, an opposition event or when Besige uh, is driving through Kampala, we see the quality of trucks that and investments that have been made to mitigate and deal with the opposition versus the money that has been invested in safeguarding the lives of Ugandans, not just in cases of fires, but if you look at our healthcare system, the government has failed to invest enough resources to safeguard um, mm -hmm. the Ugandan people. And the last point I'll mention is recovery. And this is the step NRM likes to do all the time. Whenever there's a fire, there's property damage, uh, you know, the first lady will show up and say, we're going to donate money to help you rebuild this structure, or we're going to donate money to help you rebuild this church, which was torn down and we knew about it. Uh, so that's the challenge we have in Uganda today is, we have a government that has been in power for 34 years, uh, but they have failed to put in place structures to protect the Ugandan people. Most of the investments, if you look at the national budget, and if you look at the situation involving the fires, most of the resources are being invested in making sure they stay in power. Or the money is going to the military uh, or the people in power, but less is being invested in the Ugandan people. We have so many young people who are unemployed. Why don't we train them to make sure that they can actually have uh, EMS services where people have accidents, where there's enough ambulances, where we have fire, uh, fire marshals trained to deal with fires. Those are ways in which we can deal with the unemployment situation in Uganda. But the government lacks the vision and the technical ability and the commitment to train the Ugandan people to make sure that we can improve the state uh, of our nation. So it's very heartbreaking what happened uh, to Makerere. And not all the blame is with the government, but also the institutions themselves. They have to make sure that these buildings are insured. Uh, in this case, it didn't happen. Uh, most of the structures at Makerere, including the library, they are not insured. And this is one of the best universities in Africa. 90-year-old university, and the buildings are not insured. There are no fire hydrants. There are no smoke detectors. So it shows you that uh, there's a lack of ability for the government, actually, to make sure that there's compliance across the board. So that's why we need change in Uganda. And I want Ugandans to think about uh, what's happening in their lives, the quality of life. Don't be tempted to vote of NRM because of the money they are offering you or because of the threats that they are making or because of the intimidation. We need to vote to improve the quality of life and the state of affairs in our country. At the moment, if you look at the healthcare, if you look at the economy, if you look at disaster preparedness, we are not prepared. And we need a government that is ready to invest in the Ugandan people. And at the moment, NRM has failed to invest in Ugandans, and that's why we need change in 2021. Thank you so much, Dr. Kauma, for giving us all that. Mentioning about needing change in 2021, to all our viewers, don't forget to donate to the cause. It's www.peoplepower.org.ug. Donate to the cause. Let's try to get rid of the dictator in power. Mentioning about uh, the situation at Makerere, that brings us to our education sector how failed it's been and what is going on. You've mentioned about the first lady who happens to be the Minister of Education. And just recently, we've seen that there is a billion shillings that belongs to the teachers that is already missing from the same sector. Now, we've had the principle recently of people power mentioning some of the items that the People Power Manifesto talks about and what he plans to do for our teachers and medical doctors. And he has made it clear that for teachers, the best, best salary will be 1 million shillings going forward as Noob takes over power. Comrade Agnes, when you look at the mess at Makerere and you look at the mess with the education sector, having the president, his wife, as the Minister of Education, at the same time having a billion shillings missing. Is there any hope for this country? Thank you. Yes, there is hope. Um, and um, that's why NUP is here. There is a hope for Uganda. Uh, Ugandans have to take control and take charge. Um, so um, 
the hope comes from us, from the people, from the young people, from the older people, from parents who want a different country for their children, who want a different education system for their children. Um, what comes, what, what is happening in Uganda right now is the middle, the middle class. The middle class in every, in every dictatorship um, plays a big role. The middle class always keeps uh, the dictators in, um, in power. If you, can, if you can look at history, the middle class, the military and the army, um, the military and the police are the three um, bodies that keep dictators in power. The, the thing with the middle class is they can afford a little bit of good education. Um, the middle class can afford to, to sometimes send their children to study in, in the US or study in, in South Africa or, um, or study in the best schools in the country. Um, and so they close their eyes to the rest of the country. They close their eyes to the failing schools in, in the villages and in the country where children cannot, um, cannot get a basic education. Majority of Ugandans don't have a basic education. I know a lot of people personally who cannot, who do not even have the basic, uh, basic, basic skills for survival. They don't, they can't even start a business. They don't even have the elementary education. And those are Ugandans too. And so what happens is we close our eyes to those people and then we fence our houses when we haven't equipped them with any skills for survival except stealing or, um, or harming us in any way for them to survive. They think they're people, they need to survive. They need to take care of their, um, of their families. So we close, the middle class closes their gates um, and, um, and hopes that they're secure with their families. Um, and these people are the people that are, um, that are becoming the criminals or the thugs in the country because the education system is failed. The education system has failed the majority of Ugandans. Um, and that is something we have to look at. Every, if we look at the United States, for example, where I am right now, the United States citizens are not the most educated people in the world, actually, but they all, almost every American, in fact, I think every American has a basic education. Every American has knowledge of skills and survival, or skills for survival. They have at least high school, at least high school. That high school can take you far. You can start a business, you can, um, you can be an EMT, you can be a police, a policeman, you can do a lot more in life and be able to provide for your family. Um, they don't have the most degrees, I have to say. In fact, I think Ugandans may have or a more higher educa educated people than the United States in terms of percentages. But the United States educates everybody. They educate everybody. Whereas Ugandans may have some educated people, the people who came from it, the middle class, the majority of Ugandans are not educated at all. So that is a problem that we have to fix. Now, people power in place, we will make sure that every location in the country, every location in the country has good schools that are not outpriced for the people living in that, in that location. Now, that means every in Kasese, in the people living on the islands, in the people, the people living in any part of the country should have education. This is and we are not talking about the UPE which failed where children are, are going to school under trees and, and don't have the basic, um, the basic equipment to, to learn. It has to be basic education, a basic education to teach people basic skills of survival. And this means we, sh we are going to have schools in every place in the country that are affordable. In most places where people cannot afford these schools, we will make put things in place to make sure these schools are free for those people. We will use taxpayers' money to take care of our people and to educate our people, not use it to intimidate them that the, the, the present uh, government is doing and to spend the money in buying military equipment. Uganda has the money. We, just, we are just spending it on different priorities. And we are not paying teachers well, so the teachers are not teaching our children well. And in most cases, all the teachers are concentrated in the, in the capital, which is in Kampala. Now, all the best teachers are in Kampala. 
the teachers in the country are not paid, so they don't have the motivation to teach our children. And sometimes there are not even uh, enough teachers in the villages. There is no mandate requiring all parents to educate their children. So this is something that we are going to change. Make sure every child, like again, I'll go back to the United States. And I refer to the United States because that's where I am and I've studied these systems a lot. Every parent in the United States is required to put their children in school, whether you're an illegal immigrant, whether you're a refugee, whether you're anything you are, your child has to be in school until they're 18 years old. There is no question about that. And so these are the things we'll have to put in place so that every adult, that every person who transitions into adulthood has the skills and the knowledge to take care of themselves and their families, has some level of education. The other thing that we have to, we are going to make sure of is to make sure we have student loans. Now, every country right now has student loans. I'm talking about the United States a lot, but I'll go back to our own brethren in Rwanda. Rwanda has a, school, a student loan system where people can get student loans after they finish SC, um, the secondary school and can get degrees. They can go to um, to colleges and universities and get higher education. Those have to be in place. I came here, and most of you, um, I think, may relate to this. I came here, didn't have the money to the um, hundreds of thousands to take me through university, but I got educated because I have the ability to take out loans. Now, to create, putting loans in the Ukrainian system where people who finish secondary school can go and borrow from the government these are loans that have to be given by the, by the government, not the private sector. Excuse me, because the government will be able to put lower interest on those loans, and people will be able to get education without worrying about putting collateral. Because young people don't have collateral. I don't have collateral. I didn't have collateral as a college child, but I was able to get those loans and and better myself. This will help to transition people. Um, from the from poverty into middle class. This will help our economy. Uh, these people will be able to create jobs, to get jobs, to transition where people are not that everyone born in poverty is guaranteed to stay in poverty. There will be some mobility in our country, finally, where people can move from poverty into middle class, into even um, rich. If we can get the education and make it available for every citizen of Uganda, that will be that is where um, NUP is transitioning the country to, and that is why I'm asking all Ugandans to put this upon yourselves. Every young person out there who wants to change your country, this is on you. Every old person, every parent who wants to transition Uganda into into a country that you can be proud of, this is on you. This is not on me. This is not on Chagulani. This is on you. We all have a part to play. So. Go out and vote and do everything in your power to make sure that we can transition our country into a country that we are all proud of. Thank you so much, Council Agnes, all the way from Boston. All the young people on this platform, you've heard it from the council. Go and vote. Go and support the movement. Go and support change. This is in our hands. Nobody's going to do it for you. Don't also forget to donate to the cause. We have elections coming up. We have a lot of things going on. Go to www.peoplepower.org.ug. Moving away from what you have said, Council Agnes, uh, Comrade Edward Abiri, you've heard what is happening at one of Africa's leading institutions, which is Makerere. And at this same spot, we have a question of the current president. We've all, all had rumors, he went to Ntale, he went to Makerere, he went to Dai Salaam and different universities. And the masses have been asking for the president's academic paper. It's such a simple thing. When people came up and asked for Honorable Chagulani's academic qualifications, he put everything on the media, he put it out. It, was, it, it took the electoral commission just a few days to ask, him, to ask him to bring out his academic qualifications and papers. Now, at this present moment, we have a president who has asked, we have an electoral commission, sorry, that was asked by an advocate, by a lawyer,
to bring out the president's qualifications. The, period, the waiting period was 21 days. All that elapsed. We haven't seen anything to do with the president's qualifications. Comrade Edward Abiri, people are not saying the president is not qualified at all, but people are saying, if you have asked the president of no, Honorable which are going to present his academic qualifications as an aspiring president, you should do the same. The Electoral Commission should do the same thing. Now, Comrade Edward Abiri, do you think that we have an Electoral Commission that is dancing to the tunes of the president in power? Uh, definitely uh, the issue of the academic uh, qualifications it continues to expose the NRM regime more so uh, its chairperson, who is Yuri Kaguta Museven. Uh, there's, there's a saying that states that be careful with whatever trick you try to play on your enemy, because that same trick can turn against you. And we are seeing it playing out. And so we in NUP, we are full of smiles and we are just laughing at how the NRM regime and their appointed uh, electoral commission is fidgeting. I saw uh, Mr. Biamukama on TV try to explain to Ugandans, but his explanation did not make any sense. So why are these uh, academic qualifications required of leaders? Uh, for the position of presidency, the reason why by law uh, any candidate is supposed to provide or ensure that they pass the minimum academic requirements is because the country uh, or the framers of the constitution foresaw that when you pass certain uh, limits or certain requirements, then you'll be able to be a leader that will rise above certain occasions so that we are able to have quality leaders. We have seen it evidently uh, for the past 34 years, everybody has been wondering what kind of president UL Kaguta Museven is uh, because of the decisions he has been making. But now that goes back to the screening process uh, in my opinion, it looks like he did not pass uh, the set requirements. And that's why Uganda is in shambles today. Uh, this exposes lack of transparency uh, within the electoral commission that is appointed by the same president. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, they played the trick. They thought that Bobby Wine did not have the qualifications and they went ahead. They even made it public in, mid, in the media that we are requesting for Bobby Wine's uh, academic qualifications. They did not stop at asking the qualifications uh, from the electoral commission. They also went uh, to the university, uh, Makere University. They went to the Uganda National Examination Board, and they were quickly availed with all Bobby Wine's qualifications, but to their dismay or to their shock, uh, the gentleman is actually more qualified uh, than expected. In fact, Bobby Wine with his qualification, he does not need to be president. He needs to be an advisor to president. So we thank him uh, for humbling himself with all the qualifications that he has achieved that is still willing to go ahead and serve the country. Uh, we all know that Bobby Wine uh, went to Harvard University. Uh, Bobby Wine went to Makere University. He went through the Uganda secondary education system, uh, advanced level, high school, and then also the primary education and he was able to excel uh, through uh, to be the gentleman that he is today. So that takes us to the question, why is it that the electoral commission is quiet about uh, 
Museven's qualifications. One, we don't know. I don't want to make an allegation that Museven does not have these qualifications. Uh, then two weeks after these qualifications come in. But we are all wondering if truly these qualifications do exist. Then the Electoral Commission should come up and defend M7 and say that, look, we are doing our work. Uh, we analyze every candidate, we scrutinize every candidate, and here is the president's qualifications. But we have not seen that. But only we have seen stories from Mr. Biamukama come on TV, try to make concussions that do not exist. And nobody understood what he meant to say in that interview, but all in all he's fidgeting and he cannot say anything. And then now we see the Un Macquarie University get burnt. So we don't know, maybe they're gonna allege that Museven's qualifications got burnt in the university. So we do not know, but that should worry Ugandans that, and that should send a clear message to Ugandans that the reason why Uganda is in shambles, the reason why Uganda has failed institutions is because we have somebody holding a position of presidency that does not meet the minimum qualifications. If only Mr. Museven had only, only had even LA for qualifications, without even university qualifications, Uganda would be in a better shape than it is today. So okay. Ugandans, as we go out to vote, let's vote for Bobby Wine that has all the qualifications so that we can have a better country. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Comrade Abiri. Uh, Dr. Kauma, in one minute, should we worry about the future of the elections if the leader of the Electoral Commission is playing double standards that today he could be able to ask Honorable Chagulani for his academic qualifications, put them out immediately and fail and comes up and says that the, the current president does not have to prove to the nation with his academic qualifications because he has already presented them in the previous election. Should we worry about the future of the elections, Dr. Kauma, just in a minute? Yeah, I think the, the even the Supreme Court of Uganda has proved that uh, you know there has been extensive rigging in the previous election. So we have to bear that in mind. And Honorable Chagulanya has been very clear about protecting the vote. So that that's something which uh, we cannot trust Biawakama. We have to verify. We have to verify for ourselves. Uh, and it's important that NUP deploys uh, enough uh, voter observers across the country to make sure the vote is protected. Because certainly Biawakama can't be trusted. Uh, if all of you remember, he was deeply involved in the case against Kiza Besige when he was mm -hmm. accused of rape. Uh, he's, he, uh, he was involved in that. And maybe that's what uh, qualified him to, to take over from Chigundu uh, to be the head of the Electoral Commission. He's, he's definitely can't be trusted. He lied about the eight commissioners who, who got dismissed. He said it was mm -hmm. early retirement. Uh, we found out later on from Museveni when Museveni said he fired them uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and now we see this double standard where uh, Honorable Chagulani's transcripts are, are, are released. But when it comes to Museveni's transcript, uh, they have been posting all kinds of uh, you know, folders showing how Museveni was uh, one of the honors student in Dar es Salaam and so forth. Uh, if he was such a great student, why are they afraid of showing his transcript? I mean, I've never seen an S student afraid of showing his A grades. I mean, this will be uh, the first. So yeah, uh, if yeah. he's actually a good a student as they claim he is, uh, the Electoral Commission should come out and show us uh, Museveni was an A student. Yeah, his, his transcripts. But, but I think most of us know they're hiding something because if you are not trying to be transparent, that means there's a problem uh, with the documents that Museveni presented to the Electoral Commission. That's why they are fumbling and they are struggling to, uh, to make those public. But uh, but to answer your question, I think uh, as far as the election is concerned, we have to make sure we protect the vote. That should be really the number one uh, concern for NUP. These shenanigans are going to continue happening. They are going to continue to use every institution that they can, the way they are using 
The military right now with Chibalama is the same way they're going to use Biabakama uh, on the Electoral Commission to tarnish the reputation of Honorable Chagulanyi, but we need to keep our eyes on the prize, focus on the election, making sure when the votes are cast, they are counted and they are supervised, and we verify that, uh, that they announce the correct way. So uh, that's where our focus should be, uh, but the double standards should be expected because Biawakama is definitely an agent of Museveni. Okay. Thank you so much, Doctor, mentioning how Biawakama is an agent of Museveni. So to our viewers and all Ugandans who are watching us here, you have all the reasons to worry about the future of our elections. And what is the way forward? The way forward is to go and vote and protect your vote. I repeat this, you don't only vote, but you protect your vote. Because if you don't protect it, then you can't claim it was rigged. You have to protect your vote. And I know Dr. Kauma, you've talked a lot about Makerere uh, uh, being one of Africa's historical institutions, most vibrant, most recognized universities, meaning that this university has produced a lot of quality products, quality graduates all over the globe. Now, just recently, we have seen that one of those products, who happens to be a Mr. Uh, Mr. Rubashaija, in Yiganga town, around the 18th of, 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 of September, was whisked away by the CMY agents. Now, this gentleman is one of the authors of the best sellers. He's the author of uh, the Banana Republic, a bestseller in the country. And Dr. Kauma, listening to people like that, people that are able to put out information to the public, people that are supposed to, people that are publishing the best knowledge that our kids have to read while going up in our schools. When we see people like this being whisked away by the regime agents, just because they have written down books or authored books that are best sellers in the country. What does this say to us as a nation? What does this say to us, to the president that we have in power and the security agents that we have? Are we then going to go and stop our kids from acquiring all these degrees from Makere because we know the better you get, the more annoyed the regime becomes. So they try to step on you. Comrade, uh, Dr. Kauma, what do you have to say about the CMY whisking away such a great author and a student of Makere? Yes, certainly uh, we have an issue with freedom of expression in Uganda, which uh, is protected by the constitution. Uh, it's also protected by uh, international law, including uh, the African Charter on Human Rights, Human and People's Rights. Uh, but we have seen over the years that um, uh, the Lebanese government has used domestic laws um, to crack down on citizens. Uh, particularly, we, we have seen the Computer Misuse Act, uh, which um, we all remember for uh, the imprisonment of uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi, uh, where they, uh, they, they alleged cyber harassment, uh, among other things, offensive communication and so forth. So um, the NRM government has used domestic laws uh, to curtail free speech uh, and freedom of expression. And, and the design is to silence the opposition uh, because that, they have always found a way to legally uh, silence the opposition. And they have done that mostly through uh, the domestic laws uh, that, that they have used to curtail uh, journalists and authors uh, like, like Mr. Kakwenza, but they have also used it to silence the media. If you look at the Uganda media today, and I think we discussed this a few weeks ago where they use the UCC, uh, which always threatens to shut down uh, media outlets, uh, media houses like Monitor, NBS, NTV. Um, they all face the threat of being shut down uh, because of uh, either inviting members of the opposition or materials that is shared or said uh, in their media houses. So this is an issue which is very concerning uh, because it has also turned into a human rights issue because uh, in this case, when Mr. Kakwenza uh, got arrested, and this is not the first time they're arresting him. If most of you remember in April, uh, after releasing uh, his first book, The Greedy Barbarian, 
Uh, he was arrested uh, for that. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that when they arrested him and they, the court told the CMI to come and charge him in court, they did not charge him for his book. They used COVID-19. If you look at the case they made before the court, they said he violation the president's COVID-19 guidelines because he made a post on Facebook uh, encouraging people to disobey the presidential directives. So, and, and we discussed this issue where uh, every department in Uganda, whether it's the Ministry of Health, whether it's the Electoral Commission, whether it's the military, whether it's the police, is being used to go after the opposition. So here is an author, he wrote a book and you're using COVID-19 guidelines uh, to charge him in court. They came, they arrested him in front of his family in April. They tied him up. They took him to Mbuya where he was tortured. And he, he, he wrote his second book, The Banana Republic, outlining his ordeal uh, in Mbuya where he was tortured by CMI uh, for seven days. Uh, and when they were torturing him, they were asking him about his book. He said he wrote a work of fiction, but they were asking him where he found his sources uh, for the material he wrote in the book. Uh, so the regime is doing whatever they can to intimidate uh, young Ugandans. And it's unfortunate because you want to encourage Ugandans to write, uh, to, uh, to engage uh, in academia, uh, to engage in literature. This is a very talented writer. He's 31 year old. He's an activist. He's a journalist. He's a law student. Uh, and he has a, a, a great future uh, in literature. But his future is being, uh, because he's talking about uh, the regime and the corruption that is happening in Uganda, his right to free speech is being uh, suppressed uh, by NRM government uh, using domestic laws. So that's something which uh, all of Ugandans should be concerned. In fact, if we do not have social media today, uh, it's hard to believe that this movement will be where it is. We wouldn't be having Red Friday. We wouldn't be having uh, Honorable Chagulani because social media is the only platform Honorable Chagulani has right now to put his message out. He can't even go out and hold a concert. He cannot sing. Um, even in parliament, they're deploying po uh, military and police uh, in, in parliament. So attacking the media, attacking freedom of speech, attacking journalists is what NRM has done uh, to silence their political opponents. Uh, it's something which uh, we as Ugandans uh, should speak out against. Uh, because it's the threat for everyone. Uh, because if we cannot talk about what's happening in Uganda's hospitals, if we can't talk about what's happening uh, in our job places, we can't talk about what's happening uh, even in the diaspora where Ugandans go uh, and seek employment and they go tortured working under terrible conditions. If we can't talk about what's happening in Uganda, these problems cannot be solved. So uh, we need to continue being advocates for free speech. Uh, freedom of media, our journalists shouldn't be intimidated uh, or locked up. Uh, even Ugandans who want to write a book shouldn't fear that if I write this sentence, then I'm going to be arrested uh, by the government because they think I was writing about President Museveni. That's not where we want Uganda to be. In fact, uh, when they came in 1986, they came, they were fighting to liberate Ugandans. But it doesn't sound like Ugandans feel liberated with all that's happening right now, being locked up just for writing a book. So we should continue defending authors uh, like Mr. Kakwenza and others who are rotting in jails. Recently, uh, we had a member of parliament who just uh, announced how there are hundreds and hundreds of Ugandans in safe houses today. Not because they have committed crimes, but because they are expressing themselves, uh, because they are wearing a red barrette or a red t-shirt or campaigning for Honorable Chagulani. So we need to continue speaking out against that and hoping uh, for a better Uganda come 2021, because the only way we're going to change is by uprooting the current regime, uh, which is engaging in such human rights violations across the board. So uh, let's continue uh, defending uh, the rights of our fellow Ugandans to express themselves. Let's continue defending our journalists. Let's continue expressing ourselves and having the courage to speak up, because that's the only way Uganda will be changed for a better. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kauma, for that great analysis. To all our viewers, you've heard what these great men and women have said to us. We have a country where there is no freedom of speech. You all saw what happened to Honorable Tamaguzi. You also, you all know we have never seen Kibalama again. 
was kidnapped by the same people. You all know we have just had Mr. Kibalama. Uh, when I say Kibalama, I need Kibalama, the gentleman that was kidnapped by the regime agents. And he was an accountant who was planning to stand as a member of parliament. We've never seen him again. You've all heard what Honorable Tamaguzi said to us when he came from Kitalia prison. Thousands and thousands of Buganda kids. And I want to say Buganda because this is what he said. Buganda kids are inside those jails, purposely because they support no. We've all had the current, the, the, the previous lead of no, Mr. Chibalama saying uh, 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 he met the CDF, the command of the defense forces, meeting a leader of a political party. Ladies and gentlemen, stand up. Let's go and protect our vote. Because if we don't do this, we will never do it again. Comrades, as we wind up, uh, Dr. Kauma, Council Agnes, uh, Coordinator Abiri on my panel, in one minute each, you are all going to give us a closing statement, also going to tell us what is happening in your areas. And from my side, from South Africa, I want to say to all the people in South Africa that the certificates are ready from Kampala. We are waiting for them. For all those people who paid for their certificates, so, so, some of those will be arriving very soon and the certificates will be ready. We encourage all the people to support the cause. Buy your certificate, have your certificate on your wall. This is a historical thing to do. Your grandkids will always look at that and say, look here, my dad supports my mom, my friend, my sister stood for the right cause. He stood on the right side of history to liberate our country. Please come support. Please buy the certificate, support the cause, donate to the cause. It's www.peoplepower.org.ug. We have a launch of note cards this weekend in South Africa, here in Hauteng province. We have a launch in Jemistin. We ask all of you to flock that area, buy your membership card, support the cause. We have a launch in Bloemfontein coming over this weekend. Go and support, go and get your card. You can't be someone who doesn't belong to anywhere. You have to belong to somewhere. And if you need to belong to somewhere, then you have to be on the right side of history. Go to Bloemfontein, get your card. I know there are events coming up in Cape Town. We know there are events coming up uh, in, um, in Kimberley. Please support Noob, support the cause, get your membership card. Comrade Abiri, uh, Dr. Kauma, I know there is something happening in the diaspora. I will start with you. Can you please give us a closing statement and also give us what is happening in your area? Uh, so thank you everyone who has been able to tune in today. Um, as we have listened, uh, whether you're talking about Uganda's education system, whether you're talking about healthcare, whether you're talking about our elections, our human rights, we need better governance. The only way we're going to be able to achieve better governance is by having new leadership. Uh, NRM has been in power for over 34 years. We have seen what they can do or and they cannot do. Um, and I think uh, all the signals are that we need change. Uh, we cannot uh, assume change is going to happen by electing the same people over and over again and expect different results. We need change in leadership. Honorable Chagulani is offering that change. NUP is the vehicle for us to get where we want to do, uh, where we want to get, uh, to have a better education system, to have better governance, to have uh, freedom of speech, individual liberties, so that Ugandans can enjoy their country. So that even us, we don't have to be here in the diaspora. We can go back home and live with our families and be able to prosper in our own country. That's the dream we want for Uganda. And the only way we're going to achieve that is by supporting Honorable Chagulanyi. Uh, in our community here in Washington, D.C., we also have uh, an event this Saturday starting at 1 p.m. It will be at Buttonsville Park. Uh, go and get your NUP membership card. That's the only way we're going to be able to support the candidates that are going to bring change in Uganda. Because without new leadership, we're going to continue discussing these issues year after year. We saw fires happen in 2008. Fires are still happening now without them being addressed. And the reason is because we don't have the right leaders in place. So to support the new leaders who are going to bring change in Uganda, we need to support the candidates on the ground financially. Buy your membership, donate through the website, 
reach out to your coordinators. Uh, if you have a candidate in your con constituents who you know, help them, help them win. Uh, we don't have state resources in the opposition the way NRM uh, uses our taxpayers' money. So we have to chip in ourselves. So in, if you live in Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area, uh, please show up on Saturday, 1 p.m. Batonsville Park, uh, buy your membership card. If you are worried about COVID-19, we're also doing drive-through. You can come, with your, you just stay in your car, get your card and go back home. We can also mail you that card. Uh, uh, reach out to Patricia or Karim Tambi. They'll mail you your card uh, once you call them. So again, uh, I encourage all other people in other communities. I know some of them, you have already had your events. If you hadn't had the opportunity to get your membership card, reach out to your coordinators. Let's continue the fight for building a better Uganda. Thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much, Comrade uh, uh, Dr. Kauma. Comrade Abiri, in one few seconds, closing statement. Uh, thank you, viewers, for tuning in uh, into this wonderful show. I would end by saying that the future and the destiny of Uganda should be a concern for any and for all Ugandans. Therefore, let's all come together. Let's support NUP. Let's support Honorable Bobby Wine Chagulanyi uh, for a better Uganda. Uh, on the 22nd of October, we are going to have uh, a, a, an NUP uh, uh, gathering uh, in Texas. Uh, that will be in, in Dallas, in his home uh, park. Uh, all the NUP coordinators all over the US will be in Dallas. Uh, you are all welcome. Uh, we are gonna have uh, meals, games, and we are gonna fundraise for NUP. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Abiri. Uh, uh, Council Agnes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you our viewers, um, those who have been with us today. Um, my closing statement really goes back to um, emphasizing that this is, this is our time. This is the time that we liberate, we get to liberate our country. We, uh, Uganda has been lied to before, Uganda has been fooled before, but this is us now. This is our time to actually, to actually be there and to make the difference that we want to see. We, we've been complaining for so long and this is the time that we get to do. So we've done all the complaining. We all know the bad things that NRM has done. We all know the, um, the bad things Museven has done. I cannot tell you that. If you're Ugandan, you know. You know exactly what's going on. You know the, the education, you know, you know the hospitals, you know everything that you face every day. So we are done complaining. We are done discussing the bad things. Now is the time to look at what could be, what is going to be, and this is, we getting involved and we being heroes of our own country. We have been waiting for the heroes to come and rescue us in time and again, the heroes have disappointed us. So now we are the heroes. We are the heroes of this generation. We are the heroes of our country. So this is a time you go and vote, protect your vote, protest uh, when, you are, when your vote is uh, rigged, you, you have the right to protest. You have the right to peacefully call upon other people peacefully again we are people of peace so we are not going to cause any violence violence comes from the government violence violence has not been perpetrated by the opposition not NUP so we are going to do everything using peace we are not going to fight we're not going to beat anyone or instigate any violence we are going to do this peacefully and um, the the NRM regime took power by violence they've kept power using violence that's all they know. Let them not move us to, to do the wrong thing. Let them not um, persuade us to hurt our, our um, relatives, our siblings, our um, comrades. Let's be peaceful people and uh, move Uganda forward using peace. For the first time in history, Uganda is getting change using peace. This is your time, this is our time, this is everyone's part, every Ugandan. No matter how old you are,
This is your time to be a hero of your own generation. Um, um, in terms of what is happening in Boston this weekend, um, on Saturday, on Saturday the 26th, um, that is tomorrow, we do have um, a Zoom fundraiser. Um, if you don't, if you need a link and you're not part of the platforms that I shared the link on, you can call, you can text me or call me. Uh, my number is 978-375-2918. Again, 978-375-2918. You can call me or text me to send you the link for that Zoom fundraiser. That fundraiser, please, when you're coming, come with at least some money. Again, it's a fundraiser. It's not a meet and chat. So please come and support the movement however you, you can. There is no amount. Any amount is, is um, accepted. Um, we do also have another event coming up. Um, on October 10th, we have, a, uh, we have a Freedom March. The Freedom March is in response to the perpetual independence that Museveni has been lying us, um, to us that we have. We don't have independence under the NRM regime. So in response to the independence day, um, we are uh, carrying out a march. Um, the people in Massachusetts, that march will start um, on Waltham, Waltham, at Waltham Commons. It will walk um, towards uh, Totem Pond Road, which is Mumiti. Um, if you can't make it to the beginning, you can come to the end. You can take a shortcut, come and park um, Mumiti parking and interact with other Ugandans, come with your masks. Um, come prepared, uh, and then um, and the, the, there'll be food. There'll be food, there'll be um, lots of um, NUP merchandise, come with your, your wallets full, um, and buy some merchandise, there'll be berets um, uh, and other things as well. Lots of things that you can buy, there'll be food um, as well. So um, if you have any questions, you can uh, contact me. I gave you the number, you can contact um, our, um, our leader here, Dorothy Stewart, or you can contact Herman, um, or anyone you know that is on the leadership, really, I will give you more details on that. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, it, it's been a pleasure to, um, to share with you. Thank you. And it's always a pleasure having you comrades on this panel. You don't get so many platforms where you have a qualified accountant, a superb medical doctor, a superb advocate. You, got, you don't get so many platforms like that on social media. I must be the luckiest moderator and Ugandans must be the luckiest people having such a platform. It's always a pleasure having you comrades on the panel. We always hear on Red Friday, 7.30 p.m. Ugandan time. Tune in, get to learn, get to liaise, get to understand what is happening in the world and in Uganda. So you can go away with something new to learn. It's always good to learn. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. Donate to the cause at www.peoplepower.org.ug. The power is in our hands. I thank you.